Okay, folks, we'll be getting getting going on the first discussion. And online folks, I'm assuming you can hear us okay, uh, hear me at least. Uh, so let me, for this one, I have a few slides to start with because it's my starting notes. Uh, and then we'll be updating these uh, for most of the discussions. I just have a thought prompt and that's that's all I'll be showing. Uh, so for uh, thinking about needed measurements, um, I'm asking everyone to assume for a planet that we're going to go explore. Assume we know little directly about the surface and near surface processes, but we have some untested models and ideas. We may have some broad contextual information, such as from orbit, such as images of dunes and ripples. And we're thinking about trying to send a small to medium mission. So anything that would require a 10 meter mast or a tank probably is outside the feasibility realm. Um, so what's most so the question is what's most important for us to measure with respect to understanding these surface atmosphere processes and in this case focused on aeolian um, i'm going to present some starting answers here based on what i've been hearing through the week and the previous discussions let me step through them all real fast and then we'll go back and edit each of them and so these basically will be our notes um, and then again at the end we'll treat these as the measurements that we want for discussions two and three so this gives us a common framework to work within um, and yeah, folks online, I've got your chat now up on the screen, so feel free to chime in. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. And as we discuss this, please try not to jump straight to instruments other than keeping the phys broad feasibility envelope in mind. Try not to jump straight to instruments. That's discussion too. And moderate, if you can help pull back, somebody starts going off on an instrument discussion too. discussion too. <laughs> And I may occasionally ask for the mic if there's uh, people online that have things. Okay. Uh, some things I'll throw out. This came out of uh, Planet in Situ 22 workshop, uh, but some considerations I've already got noted down. In general, when we're interested in these investigations, we want high frequency measurements during the events of interest. Uh, for instance, during the wind gust or a passage of a convective uh, vortex or a dust double. During other times, we need just enough to characterize the trends. Uh, we need a simple enough site and set of observations in order to match it to a model. Um, and so we generally would probably benefit from a fixed location through a long time so as we can get diurnal and seasonal cycles and perturbations. Um, uh, but, you know, some initial optimization of location orientation might be helpful. And we are aiming to tr uh, collect measurements from a location or with an arrangement so as to minimize spacecraft instrument induced perturbations. Instruments need to be robust to getting to the observation site and then the environment. So that's kind of a broader context of things that we, we know from last year that were high priorities. All right, so the types of data um, that we're looking to collect, again, I've got these three areas. In terms of contextual and environmental information uh, for wind and atmospheric science, sorry, climate and atmospheric data, winds, very high priority, obviously, for, for our group and for most who are studying climate in the atmosphere. Um, one thing I've got in yellow there, because we've had many discussions around this, if you're getting a vertical wind profile, how many points do you need? <laughs> at least two if you're going to fit that curve, right? But there was a discussion on the bus uh, as we were all heading to the field trip of maybe if we just know that the winds are above the threshold speed and we know the wind direction, one is enough. Like, do we actually need that full vertical profile? Uh, you need the surface pressure, you need temperature at the ground and ideally at the same heights as where you're getting your wind measurements, uh, precipitation and humidity information. Uh, for geologic context, the understanding of the local topography and variation of surroundings, um, and then a sense, it would be good if we had a sense of regional topography so as to feed into, uh, you know, identification of synoptic meteorological disturbances. For sand and saltation, we've got measurements of just the sand grains, their sizes and shapes on the surface, and perhaps repeat data tracking changes. Um, maybe how important is it to know their composition? Uh, saltation, uh, we want to be able to at least detect when saltation starts. We might want to measure the saltation flux. Uh, we might want to know something about the grain size distribution and height of those saltating grains. Um, maybe even getting to the point of saltation trajectories, right? But we're kind of going in higher complexity down here. So the question is, what, what is most important uh, for a given investigation? And, and we're going to be mixing investigations here. I know, so there, there's, we wouldn't necessarily collect all of these measurements on these lists for any single mission. Um, and then I wasn't sure about reptation and creep. In general, that hasn't been a focus, but I just want to check with this group. Is there something key that we would want to be looking at there? 
And for dust emissions, this is the one I've been learning the most myself about this week. Um, for the dusty surface, the source of that dust, uh, we want to understand something about its friability. Um, its fine scale surface roughness uh, also seems important because whether or not it's fluffed, right, seems to really tie into whether or not that material can be released. Um, and then the existence of any, I'm not sure if I worded this right, the existence of environmental cycles that might affect the above. So is this just a state or is this a, a, a seasonal or a yearly cycle that it goes through? Uh, can you deplete the surface or will it get, re, you know, rejuvenated um, at, at, as the cycle continues? Uh, particle characteristics, do we need a grain size distribution? I wasn't quite sure about that. We know they're dust. <laughs> It might just be enough that we know that they're small. Um, electrostatic charge is probably really important, especially for a place like Mars that's highly arid. And um, don't know how important composition is for like source studies or, or understandings of any of those other properties. Um, and then the dust movement is definitely interested in uh, important, right? We want to understand how much dust is getting off that surface. So something that measures the amount of dust in the air as a function of time. So that was where I started with. Um, we can now take discussion. We'll start on contextual environmental information. And if you think something's really important or really not important, give a sense why and it, it, like what sort of investigation are you thinking in mind? Because it might be important for one investigation, but not for another. Let's start. In particular, help me with that end. Here. <laughs> it started on talk about what the drag device we do in terms of a vertical wind profile, which I didn't have time to talk about here today. Um, we didn't have ability to spiral upward um, and take uh, a vertical wind profile. Um, we will we'll be measuring uh, the uh, temperature, the wind speed, direction, the humidity, the uh, relative hydrogen uh, abundance. Uh, as we go up and down, um, we originally had a very high emission to meet us very often and go very high. The engineers are now uh, thinking it could be a little more challenging um, in terms of energy than they thought. So we're not going to be able to get as high as we had uh, originally hoped, but we should be able to get up to um, perhaps a, a kilometer or two. We were hoping to get to four and a half. Uh, and we'll be making measurements every 10 meters to try to resolve uh, the planetary boundary layer. And we have at least two of these uh, uh, programmed in. One, um, for, you know, in Titan morning and one in Titan afternoon. Um, and we're hoping to, uh, to retarget a bit. We have originally worked with doing uh, measurements all the way down. Um, but now we're planning to, uh, you know, try to take some measurements lower down and try to make up the fact that we can't get as high as we'd hoped um, for our um, vertical profiles. Uh, so we can get at least one good profile on the way down. Um, Two is like not as many as we like, right? We like to have more profile, um, but uh, that that's something we can do. Um, so that's uh, where we're at at the moment. I'm just trying to twitch in the mind. Let me know if that's any clearer up online. So from uh, Don regarding wind profile. Uh, and can be one if you believe in any herbarium derived wind stress. Uh, but more in nice if it can be avoided. I don't think you can do a credible dust lifting experiment without wind stress directly measured. So this is um, responding to Don. So we've had so many discussions about this. So measuring the wind stress directly is like the wind stress directly on the surface is what I'm talking about. And so I'm curious if you mean directly on the surface or just from one, um, one at one height. This is Don. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me, um, but yes. Uh, I, I did not imagine measuring it like with a force plate on the surface. I think that would be really difficult to do. Um, I'm not averse to it, but I kind of doubt that it would be successful at Mars. I was more meaning either a vertical profile of, of wind speed or an eddy covariance at one level.
Yeah, hi, um, Andreas Bass from King's College London. Um, just looking at the list, I was wondering if we should include something about um, flow stratification in the list of things we'd like to understand better, because particularly with the massive temperature changes at the surface, um, particularly at night, I wonder if, you know, there's, there's a lot of flow stratification possibly happening, which will have a massive impact on the turbulence, which we then are trying to link to sand flux. Um, so is there a way to measure that? This is John Kelly's from Desert Research Institute. I, I think I'd, I'd like to add one complication that appeared this week that uh, Philippe Claudin brought to our attention is perhaps a pre prevalence of transitional flows. And even if we're not even sure how to do any covariance under those conditions, or even what a profile will tell you if the Reynolds number tells you you're in transitional flow. And he found it at like both scales of roughness, both uh, you know ripples and then on the bigger ripples, that that starts to open up some uh, I think basic science questions again on on how how you interpret the data if the Reynolds number tells you you're in a transitional flow. But I'm I'm all for you know the the concepts of of the eddy covariance and the sonic anemometer or hot wire if it's is something I think that's you know that's the direction to go. But I think now we have some caution on how to interpret those. Okay, thanks Jack. We've got one comment there uh, online from Don as well. Um echoing the one comes up for the atmospheric stability point uh super strong and in orbit of Mars. Okay. Anyone else can be on this we missing this is just this is Ryan you just to say them just a little bit on the context. Uh, I think there was somebody from DRI who had the LIDAR derived rough, roughness calibrated for the pi soil, uh, but that could play in here as some issue on this develop. But we talked about that with Miami, how to do that. But I, that was a good example of there's a bunch of different surfaces we can at least calibrate to it, even if we don't have a great understanding of it. No, well, thank you from GSGS. I was just going to add to that that that's uh, Josh had a poster about that at uh, ICON this week. You can do that. It's, you know, it's, we're not talking about aerodynamic roughness, so I'll make a distinction between that and instead what we're talking about the microtopographic roughness. Um, but it's certainly it's a physical measurement for one to create uh, that you can make with the LIDAR instrument or photogrammetry. Um, it's also Related to and correlated with their dynamic roughness. Um, and then maybe when we get the instruments, we can talk about that more. But it's certainly, you know, best case scenario, we can use the minor and so the photogram truth in that. Okay. Um, this is still in the digital title. Um, I am. Personally interested in the like surface properties for granular consolidated materials, but um, the correlation with the like microtopographic roughness and the material properties, which is like uh, I think it was on a previous slide, um, that's like a potential area to double the if we you know lithology from um, um, that could have an associated. You could identify an associated uh, probability potentially for that. Yeah, Ryan, you text saying um, another thought about the particles reminded me of that. Just thinking about characterizing particles as we've always used photo on Mars and. And I guess one question is, is that good enough given that there are error bars around that? And if it's not, then we need a solution for that. And then there may be a few things we could do, uh, but uh, the, the, I, don't, I don't trust it fully, um, but uh, that it could be an issue for us. 
It's a good uh, segue to the other sets of measurements. Um, did you have anything? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'd like to say, um, that the um, the errors, in particular when we have a, a very dusty place, I think that's something that we haven't really got a good hold on so far. And I think on Mars is a much bigger deal. The other thing I wanted to comment on is if we have this thermal instability, well, this instability in the temperature, I'm, I think we should have temperature measured at height and so height profiles along with the wind measurement so that we can correlate that instability. One more. No, they're all coming down. <laughs> uh, Joel, thank you again from the That just made me think that in an ideal setting, you'd also have uh, the temperature um, of the ground surface itself, right? So, yeah, yeah and, and a way to actually be looking at the exchange you know, between the sediment surface and, and the box in the air for a box. Uh, John X, a gentleman, University. I also agree that we should at least once measure the electric field on Mars, especially uh, because we don't know exactly the electrical properties of the Martian atmosphere. And we think that the way, if there is so many dust events, we should see something also uh, with connection to dust events, electrical uh, electrical fields should change. So I think that it's really important, especially for dust science. All right. Okay. I'm going to move us move forward. That. Feel free to keep bringing up things, but we've got the sand saltation and dust uh, emissions too. But I did bold, I think the things that came out as the most important. Okay. So sand and saltation, or feel free to jump to dust emissions and I can flip back and forth. Let's see about university boxes. Related to the LIDAR measurements, but the surface roughness, a lot of Joe Neal's work looks at saltation heights from LIDAR measurements as well. So it's another possible place for double digit there. Okay. Something I wanted to mention for you side, but it's moved more here too, is uh, grain size from thermal inertia with Venus is really. Uh, I don't know how widely this is known, but it's kind of considered controversial for the people who are measuring it. And uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the ability to ground truth that is a big deal, but also um, kind of expanding what we can do with it and with in situ measurements. But um, uh, I, I feel like I, I only know people who are trying to just compare to Venus, but if you're just getting the, the same measurement from the lab in situ, you, you might be able to do more fine layering and looking at it. Um, Sort of goes under the last uh, header of the uh, subsurface or like the near subsurface uh, of the top two grains. But um, yeah, the velocity of that kind of two millimeter step uh, might be possible. Thermal inertia measurements. Thank you. Just a quick note, but Jake has uh, already approved of that no idea on there. <laughs> Would be great to uh, measure mass density of particles. I know that we have grain composition for example, chemical or my minerals from that field, and mass density, uh, it would be great. Forgetting to introduce myself, could do slide from our coast. Um, but I think it would be important for us to measure the coefficient of restitution. On the surface itself, and that leads to also measurements of the way we get that is measurements of particles, the particle speed, in addition to just the, the flux as well. At the Leeds Desert Research Institute, I think um, I really think maybe the uh, you know the electrification sensor might be dual purpose too for. Um, dust and even maybe saltation. If a, if a, if you observe a change and for triggering instruments potentially, if you're seeing a, a, a change in the electrical field, it's saying something's either happening or about to happen, and it might be something that could be used to decide when to turn on a critical instrument. 
I'll come back. This is uh, Josh McCaster with USGS. Um, I think four great characteristics will be kind of interesting as if we can get it some sort of metric of aggregation, like if these grain particles are aggregating or if we have just this articulator or material that can be moving around on its own, but some sort of aspect of aggregation. Um, just before we turn to you, uh, just to pick up on the fact that Don's uh, raised a question there. Is there an effective depth of interest thermal inertia measurement? Can we use the other sort of temperature measurement changes, or is that effectively too deep a measurement? So I'll let people ponder that more briefly while I'm going to your point. Anna Baker, North American Arizona University. Um, so I wanted to first echo the uh, density of particles and see that that might be more important than the grain composition in terms of scaling out to a, a global um, physical processes. And for the grain composition, we can decrease the importance of that by choosing a very homogeneous area with a very uh, set composition. So um, uh, as much as I would love to have grain composition data, um, I think choose, we can choose a site in a way that it avoids that necessity. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jack, remember what he was about to say. Yeah. I, uh, I think that the, the technology of optically sensing the movement of particles is almost sufficiently developed now to tell you particle speed and in the right configuration tell you what's going up and what's going down, the speed of those particles. We're reaching that kind of ability with, the, with sensors that already exist. And so we might be drifting towards instruments that yeah. aren't there, but uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of things coming in. And also just realized the question from Jake uh, online there does time of day or time of year change the importance of any new movements? Which I would imagine the answer would probably resound in yes in some cases. Uh, I'll come to you in a moment. Hi, Lynn um, I think just if I go through your comments, um, I question of reputation and creep. Um, Yes, I think that if we, we've already shown this week the possible like oversight of not incorporating creep and reputation into our model and our estimates. And so kind of going into this, I would kind of suggest maybe not separating out suspended and not suspended transport and, tra and, and uh, not just the on mm -hmm. sensation. Framing it that way. Right, and then Ryan. Right, so, yeah, it's Andreas again from Kings Coast London. Um, with this saltation flux, I, I, I would really, really like to urge um, the lateral component, spanwise durability of some of those flux, because it tends to measure either just in the vertical or with the laser sheets um, parallel to the flow, but I don't think we've got enough information on um, spanwise durability in fluxes. We tend to just do a time for space substitution, but I'm not sure how reliable that actually is. Uh, just to comment back on the composition, um, I agree about density. That's, a, that's an unknown, but uh, for dust, it, what I gathered this would be uh, dust person, but it seems like uh, composition may be critical. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts in answer to the Don question that was online? Um, but you have some comments. Um, you know, we saw a lot about ripples this week, and I'm curious if I'm not sure that falls into sand and saltation and concentration or rotation creep. So I just wanted to mention it that I think it's important that we are able to continue to quantify ripple migration in, in the metrics associated with it. Uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, it would be great if we have in this um, plant from the one side uh, ripples, and we could, uh, for example, measure the integration rate over some time, like, for example, a Martian year would be great. And also the orientation, because they may change. Joel, thank you for the OSGF. I might just add to that, which would then be that. It would be, I think, really nice and important that 
that was done in a way that scaled up to um, what you can measure with um, orbital, orbital imagery and uh, total graphic chain detection from, from uh, you know, like high rise DPMs. Of course, that's from the CDU. Uh, yeah, exactly. From, we can measure very small in metabolites and from all the large ones in the same area. Yeah. Did you come here on Android a few minutes ago? Sorry, no. No, this has been great. <laughs> Just another few minutes, and then we'll move to a discussion of you. Anna Baker, Northern Arizona University. Um, I just wanted to mention the saltation trajectories that uh, I don't think you mentioned. I don't know if that uh, would fall under the lateral components of the flux, um, but I think that's important for um, uh, scaling up to, to large scale measurements and for correlating lab measurements to uh, Mars and something that we uh, really can't figure out um, for these lab measurements. So. Yeah, any more comments or like questions? Sorry, wrong lines. Couple right there. I um, uh, I think Anna has a really great point about the lateral flux in solution. I don't know if I got this, but um, yeah, I think that's pretty hard to get at. And um, uh, regarding Don's question about thermal inertia, I think there's a lot more information you can get. Uh, with an active thermal inertial measurement, like a beater that they can run in the middle of the night to um, get really sensitive skin depth. Um, uh, but, you know, whatever species. And, um, but um, something else I had thought of in all of this is um, I'm not sure, I mean, on the region of Mars, if we're looking at ALA processes, this might not even be a problem, but water absorption. Um, and you know the effect on aggregation and uh, the relationship with brines, um, how all of that affects the transport process cases. I'll leave that to the instrument section. But... Thank you. The comment there from Raphael online. Coming back to saltation, maybe interesting to determine how it occurs, the origin of the saltation. I think we in some of some of the questions we touched on, but that I guess is fairly fundamental. That's not good. Any more, guys? This was the experimental grid. I'm curious about how we could do some measurement, the opposite measurement to understand the flow topographic interaction so that we could have understanding of the downstream wind pattern for the wind process. More comments and response to that. Right. I had micro topographic roughness and then broader scale local right roughness elements. Is there another aspect? Uh, one of the last comments I think about landing site context so for, for geologic context and something on a crater we want planes so things we can we can come to and it may depend on what ultra plane would land but uh, that's going to be a big one This is uh, Joshua Gass from the FCS again. But yeah, looking at the geologics there, I, I would just, I don't think we have on there that, that we really would be interested in repeat topographic data sets so we can actually get at those changes. Because I, I think uh, important for thinking about roughness is thinking about changes in roughness in response to the things that are going on at the surface, which I think tells a lot, as we found, um, about actual transport that's going on. Well, other factors that One thing about uh, bed forms, uh, small bed forms, uh, Joanna Kazakin, Wayne University, in Michigan, uh, 
because we have reports, but I think that maybe other platforms that are quite small and are related to topography, like, for example, sand shadows could be also useful and their orientation as well, because it can change uh, with one's uh, direction. Yeah. Scale, would we want probably topographic observation? Good question coming from Jake. Um, I'm going to just steal moderator's priority here and then jump in with a quick thought that hasn't come in. Let's be on my Matt Telfer University of Plymouth on the long board around the floor. Um, is there a question to be had here with some of this discussion about environmental context, about what the environment's like before and after you've just dropped several kilograms of 2000 G off the surface? Um, characterization about how bit landing itself can impact some of the that we to take in the context and the environment that we're looking at. Right. I think that can be a fun part of thinking about experimental design too, or, or landing in a late spot, that's the green effect, the surrounding that could be opportunity for watching a trip where right, you're watching some scour out. Thanks. Last comment. Mm -hmm. Is there also useful information in the actual well, what it does to the surface, whatever it interacts with, and how deep the depression, whatever, with some really big clues on strength of the of the matrix of, of the material that's on the surface. Or maybe there's a other way for engineers to work. You can use the compression data of what they're publicly expecting versus what actually happens when it interacts with that surface. I think, I think I think that's uh, just, segued into uh, <laughs> into the next discussion. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll move it off now. Just going to remind I think Jason probably confirm. I think um, Titan Huygens had some service sort of information that's derived from that, the landing there. Is that right? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, uh, so we move on. Um, should I pass the mic? Oh, you've okay. got the mic back there, so should I turn it off for a moment? Um, yes, we'll go on. Thank you so much, Matt, for moderating that and everyone for your, your comments. So as mentioned, this is a kind of a starting list, right? Obviously, it's it's incomplete. We didn't have a lot of time to develop it, but and we're mixing um, we're mixing uh, investigations here. But keep these now in mind. We're talking about kind of winds, flow stratification, temperature at the ground, um, electrostatics of the air, some of the other climate data, local topography, um, sizes and shapes of grains on the surface, mass density of these particles, various aspects of the saltation flux. Um, and, and the overall flux, uh, including rotation and creep, maybe tracking some of the small bed forms. And for dust admission, the, the surface properties that would affect the ability for dust to be released uh, and the dust particles themselves, composition, electrostatic charge. Um, and then, of course, how much is in the air. So keep those in mind as we're going through the next few discussions. Okay. So you and Madeline, who wants to go first? Oh. You, you already stood, so <laughs> you're okay. Yeah, so if you don't mind yeah. doing what Matt did, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So Matt, Matt, is it Madeline? Yeah. Matt, Maddie. Maddie, Maddie Kelly is our, our moderator for this one and helping to move the mic around. Um, but our discussion too, uh, we can start with kind of more instrument concepts, but feel free to bring in the accommodation concerns and or we'll just transition to them in 20 ish minutes. Um, when you're thinking instrument concepts, we're looking for instruments that could collect the measurements that we want. And then just ideally one that's not too big or power hungry or relies on undergrads visiting occasionally or anything like that, right? <laughs> Stuff that can't do in space. Um, and when you think about accommodation, it's that what I mean by accommodation is how do you place it on the spacecraft to get a good measurement? Does it need to be three meters away from the spacecraft, which by the way is hard for small missions? Um, or does it need to be pointed into the wind? Like thinking about those sorts of aspects that would, uh, you know, if, one way to think about it is what would generate a bad measurement, right? If there's a boulder right in front of you, that would be a bad day. So, all right, but that's that's all I'm showing. Um, I'm going to collect notes on the Google Doc instead. Uh, go ahead with discussion ideas. How do we collect these measurements? We we're starting to get some ideas of maybe how we could use the landing itself.
and say from Northern Arizona University. Uh, I sort of have a question, uh, somewhat in with respect to the planning itself, but for the shield mission design, um, uh, would the the lander, the speed of instruments stay within that? Um, I would assume somewhat destroyed uh, field that it arrived in, or is is it is there an idea for that? Yes. Yeah, so from the the shield example. Um... It, it, think of it as an egg drop experiment. The whole thing gets down to the ground, but many of the landing forces have been absorbed either through, um, you know, it slowed down in the atmosphere and then the compression. Um, at the moment, uh, for the concept that we've been working on, um, everything is on a mast in the middle or placed like on the deck. There's some solar panels and stuff. We could try to get away from it, but that adds, takes away from your science payload, right? To add engineering payload. So, so that's just the trade off. Uh, so, Five to 10 kilograms is what we're looking at, but don't be constrained by that necessarily in this discussion. Just if you have to place something far away, there are some ideas like uh, these tumbleweed robots. We've thought about instrumenting those and you throw them out and they drift around with the wind. Those are light. Maybe those could be uh, put out. Uh, you're probably not putting a rover on the surface, right? But there are other mobility mechanisms. So, yeah. You have a question, comment, and John. Uh, we're building a sonic anemometer that works at Mars, 20 hertz, less than five centimeters uh, of sensitivity and precision, grain impact sensitivity, um, approximately 8.5 uh, at full bore, less for slower uh, cadence, and a 0.5 kilogram, or approximately 0.5 kilogram with sensor head included. Um, I kind of have a, a question if no one else does. So, so has there been I'm just thinking of here on Earth that we're aware of, we're getting in situ measurements, and it's normally like a two different approach, but like with our more long term stable monitoring sites versus a more intense uh, campaign that has those higher frequency measurements, often more data. So, has there been any, any discussion on on taking that approach? So, can you set up more long term sites? Um, Oftentimes, but we can pretty easily like wait for the um, weather meteorological station. So, is there any discussion on that? We have not discussed it. Feel free, please discuss in the room. Um, in general, for planetary, if you're sending something, the idea is it operates for a long time. Uh, we've generally talked about having a one year, one Mars year mission uh primary mission timeline because we want to catch all the seasons uh depending on where you go like in the, if you go to the polar regions then it's maybe more like a season or two seasons but that's kind of the level that at least the discussions i've been in have considered right you're not going to send something to mars that operates for three days for the most part but um you know can, is it important that we get the full mars year versus maybe if we just do a season the sunny season because it's solar paneled right then that that changes it mm -hmm. Just a thought and kind of based on knowledge on this for an instrument is it's sort of general design for a lot of different applications. And in one of those that I think I've talked about when you come with this lunar, right? So looking at dust from landings. And for our purposes, maybe one thing to think about are there instruments that could be flight ready for the lunar application that would uh, cross over into. Mars because it's more likely than to get to the moon where you can go to Mars. Mm. Hi, oh, it's Andreas again. It's a question for um to Don. 20 hertz. Is that like the upper limit because uh, it's not possible to do the data processing? Or would it be feasible to go to high frequencies? I'm asking because if we're trying to use uh Reynolds shear stresses from a sonic. Um, and you're interested in really small scale intermittent turbulence, um, you probably want more than 20 hertz, but it might just not be feasible for the instrument design. Yeah, it, it starts to become difficult to do the processing that quickly. Um, you have to do some pretty sophisticated signal processing to make sonic anemometry work at Mars. And so we do start to push up against the computational feasibility. Um, we might be able to get a little bit higher than that, and it'll cost more power. Um, but 20 hertz is kind of where we feel comfortable 
claiming. I, I hear what you're saying. When you're that close to the surface, 20 hertz may not be sufficient um, because the eddy link scales are so small and therefore the time scales are, are shorter. So it's a good point. We need more monitoring away from the equator and ideally year round. Um, and Alejandro um, said the, for instrument lifetime, it depends on how you get power um, and what the environmental conditions are. And then they follow up to Ryan's comment. Do they want to unmute? Yeah. Alejandro, are you able to unmute? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, to follow up on Ryan's comment, I hadn't thought about this before, but um, a lot of the alien type measurements we've been thinking about here are not testable in an environment like the moon because you don't have a proper fluid wind or anything like that. But I do think uh, Ryan's onto something that um, Techniques for measuring dust or characterizing the surface conditions, including volatile content, which matters for Mars as well. Um, there might be some synergy here in trying to go after these quick turnaround missions on the moon where we could learn a lot of great lunar science, but also start really digging deep into demonstrating and understanding how this instrumentation would work for Mars long before we get a chance to fly something to Mars or, uh, you know, Titan. I don't see anything happening until after Dragonfly's uh, amazing success is over. Um, but anyway, I hadn't really thought of it that way. I don't know, if the, Ryan, if that's what you were going for with that, but the charismatic dust is one of the few areas where there's overlap. The, the processes that lift and move the dust around are different, but the tricks to trying to understand those things might be very similar, and it might be a nice test bed. And, Mar and you know, NASA loves this whole moon to Mars thing, so we could leverage that. Thanks. I'm Nick Mastorn, University of Baden in Switzerland, and I'm, I'm part of the ExoMars science team specifically that close up image. And I think a lot of the applications we thought about, let's say, trade movement, small feature changes, roughness changes. If we have imaging instruments either hopefully on Mars in whatever seven, eight years' time, or maybe already on Mars. I think it's really developing the applications that, that make the connection between sort of systematic observation and then coming up with some quantitative results from those observations. So I think that's really something we, we could do. That's with the thought like a lot of the only features. And then second unrelated thought, I know there are also ideas about um, small small landers that use basically a pen frame to, to slow them down. That, I guess, could be something, for example, no thermal inertia and stream and all temperature changes in the surface. A couple of comments here. So one is for Don and Alejandro on the sonic technology developing. So is there a way that we can calibrate the effect of dust accumulation over time that we're very likely going to get on the transducer head? Um, and also, is there a way for us to quantify the degradation of the sensor? And what I mean by that is running a series of um, a dirty wind tunnel experiments where we we expose it to the harshest of elements and, and how we can actually how much dust could occur and how that would change the signal. So that's one thing. Um, and then I just had this thought that is think it or leave it, but I wonder if there's a way because the hot wire anemometers are breaking and we keep sending them up. But there's a reason we keep sending them up because they're, you know, they're not a, they don't have any mechanical pieces that could physically like break off of them on impact. Is there a way that we could put like old, like the old versions of the sensors on there, like from Viking, so that we could actually calibrate, like back calibrate our observations based on what they were observing so that we have a more of a global reference or try and move better use of the data that we already Collected that we're a little bit uncertain about. In terms of looking at something like threshold in Mars, uh, I think one of the concepts that might be interesting to consider is can you engineer something 
like the Pi Squirrel, small enough to give you accurate physics, as well as calibrated well enough to tell you what the RPM is related to the shear stress. The principle is sound. If you create a shear stress under the rotating disc, it's universal. You're going to have a well-established boundary layer, and you're going to reach speeds high enough to entrain the particles. You're going to get a fairly clear identification of the of the threshold. Um, and if it's on an arm that could potentially move laterally, you can even get some spatial um, distributions. You know, how's the threshold changing? One or two pipes. Uh, the diameters away from where you started. Question will be: but Can you prove the physics that you can have it small enough, and then can you provide it enough power to turn the motor? It's it'll be harder on Mars and easier on Titan because the fluid, the, the fluid density and the viscosity are gonna. But they're eminently testable. But something like the pi swirl in your chamber. And say, I can immediately look at what's uh, potentially what the threshold is on your. If somebody can make you the organic particles that you suspect exist on Mars or on Titan, you've got a you've got a system now that could ahead of time give you an idea of threshold. Christy, and um, to respond to that, I love this idea. I think that would be great if we could have like an arm that has a pipe scroll on the bottom of it that we can kind of put in different areas. One thing that we need to do with that, right? So we're getting the shear on the surface because we're, we're controlling that. But what we have to do to extrapolate that is trust that we understand the wind observations of how we're calculating the shear stress. From the boundary layer. And I think right now we're, I mean, and I'm, I'm guilty of it because I've published on this. Like, there are a lot of assumptions that we have in what the boundary layer is doing and the sheer stress number that we get. So I love this idea. I totally think we should do it. And maybe that batch should have three on the game of others on it. I would start for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Josh here again. Um, just looking at the like the absolute simplest instruments that we send up for cameras, and so cameras are, are obviously important, and we have all, all sorts of like spectral options we do. But I guess some of the the placement considerations are important, where we get overlapping fields of view, um, and then we get sort of pixel resolution resolution as it's important, but. What I sort of see is this option of this opportunity for when we're on the ground to be able to actually track movement material that's being picked up. So if we can get that rate of speed and the pixelation right, we can actually see particles, so maybe not in the individual particles, but clouds of material. You can actually see like the, the rate of movement that we can tie back to some of these other instruments. Joel from the USGS. Um, I guess two separate comments. One, in relation to this, that I took the curious to hear those of you who thought about trade offs between LIDAR versus photo band streaming industry as working on the part of the uh, guess we, we've heard that LIDAR is too so heavy for a lot of institutions. Uh, so I don't know. That's the only control of Jason the fan. We probably talked to that regarding that. That's one comment. Another one I was thinking about the jacks and, and, um, and this, also this idea of. Trying to use the impact right as a disturbance that could be studied. Um, but I think the ability to disturb the surface um, could be really useful in front of this. It has to be used a lot in driving ecological experiments on Earth where you have a disturbance and you have a control, right? Well, it's setting up a control experiment. And you can uh, do the same thing where you simply have a, you know, like an arm that can go straight at the surface and near the surface, right? And then you have all your observational no defense, whether it's dust emissions or salt and whatnot, or similarly, disturbed surface before you put the pipe swell down, and then also uh, the pipe swell down Jason. Read some online questions. Um, so from Don, uh, we can certainly test sonic and dust load with dust loaded base. Uh, may it might self-lead to some extent. Uh, we have tested 
in the Danish moon tunnel, which is very dusty and in repair. Uh, we have also tested transducers with great impacts, some degradation, but uh, graceful performance in that case. Possible temporary coating on transducer bases possible. And then a question, oh, we, did we answer this one? Uh, question two, Don, how dry was the, was that test environment? The case data forces that encouraged duct sticking and Don um, said low, um, absolute humidity, but uncertain relevant humidity. Thanks for that. We're going to go over to Pete. Uh, Pete Terry Stavage, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I noticed you mentioned earlier about photo sitting, some of the error associated with that method. I'm not sure it's, it's not my like air expertise, and, uh, but if, if the error bars are with training simple um, issues or they can find any training samples for that um, algorithm, the Army Corps of Engineers has a citizen science program now called Science Now, and that's been kind of taking the taking a lot of different training samples on what we're getting better at you know, using your cell phone. Getting a photo of the listeners were scaling up and then getting a visible sample of that material and then sitting and trying to better tighten up that algorithm. And it's kind of, you know, I think there are thousands of samples from around the world. So we're making a lot of progress on that, but the technology associated with the you know, it's a cell phone camera, a bunch of different models, a bunch of different things, very small. So maybe there's some um, that tighten up the method that we're expecting that, but maybe some other metrics of how close that camera is. You know, and more of the local link, um, other kinds of data that you might be able to assist with. And for those that don't know before, we deal with a lot of sandy environments. And so a lot of our field sites are actually going to be able to tighten up the lab. Just something to consider if, you know, photo setting is an issue with training centers. There might be some more that will Thanks, Matt Elby, the development of um, a question and a, a thought. Um, first up, we have some discussion about the idea of um, cameras being a particularly useful tool to keep a high resolution cameras um, and extracting um, you know, great size data and movements that kind of thing. Um, but it's going to tend to be very data intensive in terms of what it generates. Does the Shield concept have any practical limitations in terms of the data upload? capabilities, or are we essentially unlimited in that? For now, too, it is unlimited. Okay. I'm just one quick follow on that. Uh, we saw really interesting stuff from uh, Insight in the, the dying days of Insight, whereby solar debt was used as effectively an, an instrumented service and an experimental service. What scope is there with the shields? Be using the solar panels, given that that's exactly what we're worried about half the time in mm -hmm. dust on the solar panels. Can we design experiments that explicitly use the solar panel surface as a test bed? Yeah, this is James King from the University of Montreal. Uh, so, just so, sorry, all of my visuals, but a comment slash question about using kind of a LIDAR or use. Use a face system like that would check a lot of boxes and then on the right to look it so you can use it for dust, sand, also use it for wind speed. And even so, though well, there may be some sacrifices, I guess, in terms of players, there's a pattern that actually do many things depending on how it's uh, And then a comment on the pipe scroll, I think one of the limitations for using it in the Martian environment, at least, is there's a sort of a no split. Assumption associated with that, and so basically assuming a fully turbulent flow in this play may not be a few limits, but that can send you or you make it really large. Yeah, so I think that's all I have. Sort of discussion we have actually with, with an extra month having these extra six years. So what what can we do to keep let's say the, the community alive that does some research, but basically can we uh, get some onboard process there? But I think then you also have to go back to the only community figuring out okay, 
uh, we, we want to reduce the data that, that had to be transmitted. So we need simple indices. So you can say so you can easily imagine okay, we take three four images to a surface model of it, but then what what index do we extract from that model because that we can't really send four or five images down to earth that's not the limitation there. So we can send a few numbers that characterize the surface, but what would that number be? I think that's I guess what the only community has to deliver. And then I guess the solar panels just a remark would be the same thing. We try a systematic study, you know, linking sort of atmospheric conditions to drop in power that is like then you know, we can use solar panels to see that. Okay, thank yeah, uh, about uh, photosynthesis and also some automatic processing on board. I think that uh, right now, we, uh, for example, all the data that I was presenting yesterday uh, was fine some real study, and we just uh, have a lot of agreement with other methods. So I'm not so sure whether photosynthesis is a bad method at all. I think it's a good method and it's very simple. And also we have right now like algorithms that can uh, do it automatically and also do it on board. So we could use it and for example, instead of sending uh, entire large ranges of very high resolution, we could send exactly this numerical uh, parameters that we need to, for example, make some studies with that or uh, or, for example, to 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 uh, make a decision whether we want something more from that. So, catch up online. Those two, and then if you can switch, yeah. Okay. So, I think Alejandro had a quick note that uh, uh, my instrument is laser based, not sonic, like John. So, the dust response will be different, but the accumulation should be manageable. And uh, Bell said one relative simple instrument is a mass spectrometer. Um, it may it may allow uh, information may allow information not only of the upper surface but also from the exosphere. And then Don uh, mentioned that um, the delicate splash hot wire hot film sensors are flown mainly due to politics and now heritage. <laughs> Uh, JPL worked on the sensors similar to Phoenix and Mars uh, Polar Lander, but have likely dropped that effort. Um, <laughs> and to advance science, I believe we need higher uh, capability sensors. Spanish sensors don't have much response below about two meters per second, and response time is less uh, like a second or longer. And we have a ditto to that. Um, Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you still be straight, Joel. Um, but I actually want to start with a question. Have anybody never been to our yeah. acoustic top water water symmetry vertically profile the surface layer? Do you know anything about it? Is it feasible? Uh, yeah, and it actually is. Uh, so, depending on software development with some assumptions, uh, currently, at least on current, well, acoustic doctor that gives you a uh, temperature profile, uh, a lot of other information. It's not just going to be. So, currently, there's ones that are really small, sort of maybe 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, uh, going to about 500 meters. This is some algorithm that you can use for a lot of other things. It's cold, it's cold. Just one uh, quick comment on that. We have LIDAR versus photogrammetry. But I don't think that's a two things against each other. They're more like complementing each other, is what I see. But we're getting different information from both. Gotcha. And so we can see some, some very different characteristics when we use LIDAR versus when we use photogrammetry. We think they're both really instrumental or both of them. And great. I wonder if maybe we should. Um, Switch to saltation because that's the other big one, right? And uh, then really discuss the instruments for measuring actual science qualities. So, who wants to keep up with that? First, John, I think she came on with the speed, very simple thing. Uh, can we think about magnets on the board of uh, Windows? 
we can talk about this and the study that we may be using for the school. And we could move in as a university. Um, uh, going off the idea of the um, uh, using the solar panel as a super strict desk, um, having surfaces at different heights would maybe be an interesting natural way to determine what size particles are being transported by what mean. Um, and so it can be like it's mean, you know, solvation suspension, that kind of thing. And also maybe help. Uh, figure out how these things. Okay. Well, we get back responders, lasers, windlers. What are we going to send up? <laughs> <laughs> well, this Jack Gillies does it in research to start a speaking as an advocate for uh, optical. I think that the the principle of operation of optical sensors have the ability to extract significant amounts of information in terms of counts as a function of height, which then be, can be converted um, to some understanding of the particle, the size distribution at each of those at, at that height, and then you can move towards getting a mass flux. But if you process the signal fast enough, and I think you can with onboard chips doing a lot of the work, you can then also extract particle speed and if you have the orientation of the optical sensors, whatever they are, it, it may be in opposition to each other, one, one beam going parallel to the ground and one beam going perpendicular to the ground, cleverly uh, executed, you would start to get part of the speed direction angle of the angle that is uh, coming up or down. So an advocate for an optical approach. And I think the groups that are are embracing that low power too because they're LEDs. Uh, Following on that, to two comments. One, oh, this is Christy Swan from Marcus. Um, one, Nick Cohn just published a paper on using a holographic camera that can get particle speed, particle size, um, and the and height, which. I'm, I would be interested to see how that would work on Mars. The other thing I wanted to say is um, I just had this kind of crazy idea that would require no power, but I don't know if it would work. If there was a way that we had, like, let's say, 20 pieces of very sticky material, right? we, we have it on like that. We, we know its size, maybe on that sticky material we have, um, as, you know, heights outlined. Could we? expose it at times when the when we have like a threshold like okay the wind speed is now above x and then we try to capture or just well let's see if any salty hitting grains like actually stick to it so it'd be really really sticky and then we use our cameras to be able to measure the particle size with height and then the flux and i'm also thinking if we had a little arm that we could that has this this um uh, made of sticky material that I'm thinking about, <laughs> if it was able to like kind of press on the surface lightly and then get the surface materials and us also do imaging that way. Anyway, I just thought about it. Sounds crazy, but Serena said we were allowed to to make to to say state our crazy idea. Yeah, I was just saying uh, we've used that with those rat traps. Well. So we used it to put in an imaging XRF so you can preserve the stratification of the distribution. But those rat traps are like not that big. So, and they're super city. I don't, you know, the operations of doing that in the United States is very different. <laughs> and, 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 and it totally works on both sides. So, yeah, <laughs> okay, we just see. Uh, this is uh, um, it's okay, but uh, we need to know that if we, uh, for example, put it in the surface to, to, to catch particles that way, it would be like um, the very top uh, most surface layer of the uh, material. So 
it's it could be like smaller particles would um, wouldn't catch that way because the larger ones would be the most uh, uh, easier to catch by sticky material. So this is one thing. And I think it, it could be it could work good. It, it could work well. It could work well with magnets as well because uh, you know uh, I mean like an additional thing sticky material and magnets because we have magnets properties and material on Mars so it's something very similar. Kelly, uh, you want to um, back to advocating for optical approach. Um, I think it's. It's, I, I mean, it's setting up a high powered laser system to do particle tracking might be extremely energy intensive. Um, but I guess I, I'm just really want to advocate for trying to at least some point get a continuous, um, like, like uh, particle trajectories over a continuous space and ideally with fluid interaction at the same time. Those simultaneous data sets are extremely valuable. Um, but also just thinking about saltation or just grains in motion. Um, just looking at the wind tunnel um, work that we've done and what Christy was able to do in the field, um, getting a full distribution of those particle characteristics is really important. That we do see changes in trajectories in terms of velocity, the angle of the particles, the different heights. Um, and so having that information at a it'll, uh, not just point measurement. Um, would be very valuable. Um, on the line, Don, we're also building a saltation impact sensor that can count impacts at just about 100 hertz, 1,000 hertz, and to resolve the impact energy separately from momentum, sensitive down to 60 micron, and combine many sensors on one platform. Um, Use the same computer as Sonic and Amon. So, so Don is advocating here for, uh, for an impact sensor. Uh, if it can separate the momentum from um, the energy, then you can get size and speed from that. Thoughts on that or comments on that? Has anybody any thoughts on um, just a simple microphone? Just actually recording the sound of the wind and the saltating rains. Any thoughts on that? Very simple. We have one on Dragonfly. Uh, we do have a microphone on Dragonfly, but we claimed it as a public outreach instrument and not as a science instrument because um, we were tr having trouble justifying it on the element science alone. Perseverance has that on the SuperCam instrument. It includes a microphone to listen to the laser ablation explosions, but um, there is a subgroup of the SuperCam team that has looked at it in terms of grain impacts and interpreting the ambient noise in, uh, for wind speed as well. It's a bit hard to interpret, um, but I think it's got some legs for an idea that could be developed. Don, do you have a sense that <clears throat> with improvements in the design of the microphone, we, it would be easier to do science analysis with it, or is it what, what we currently have with microphones is probably the best we have. No, I think you could dramatically improve it. Um, they have to send all of the signal down to the ground to interpret it. And that is tremendously bandwidth intensive and not a good choice. Um, so if you could do some sort of multi microphone cross correlation of acoustic turbulent noise, you might be able to get wind speed and direction on board. Um, and then I think just counting grain impacts from, from microphones is not that hard. And it's, it, I think it seems to work. Okay. It's just that particular instrument on perseverance was mainly built to listen to the laser shots. So there's no onboard processing and that is kind of its death now, I think. Yeah, I think I'm thinking about a microphone as complementary to an optical system. Because you wouldn't probably want to run an optical system full uh, continuously. Whereas a simple microphone counting impacts would be quite a, uh, uh, easy to run. Do we know from the software phone developer what, what information on it? We saw them in pictures, but what did they do with it? Nobody talked about that day. Microphone. <laughs> Can you just repeat the question? 
I have. I don't want to take the conversation away from microphones or other people have other comments. But can we maybe address Jake's question then, real fast? Yeah. So Jake's comment saying, could the microphone be used to trigger um, the other instruments and, and the higher making cadence? That's a sort of possibility. You know, that you, you wait for the impact and then you start with a later or comment here. Yeah, that's a great solution for um, getting the grain size distribution. Uh, once you know that the microphone uh, is detecting large grains, or anything, but you can't actually probably tell the size. I'm really interested in what you can. But... This is Christy again. Um, with the microphone and measuring propagation impact, I think that would be great. You know, and then Jean Ellis had a hard time interpreting signal whenever she was using her microphones, but she was exposing the diaphragm of the sensor. So I think it can be designed better to the signal isn't so hard to process. The other thing about the microphone is that it, I don't know if we'll be able to get anything but accounts from it if we were just concerned with um, measuring palpation because you can have a large particle moving slower have the same impact or momentum imparted on that as a small grain moving really fast and so I think it will be hard to decipher um, what that momentum is actually correlated to. Yeah I mean I'm, I'm certainly thinking from a complementary point of view um, because I guess one of the worries with the optical system is that the my dust might travel the angles of that. I think there would be ways to call that out, but I think it would help with what whatever the uh the for lack of a better word, the glass that covers the LED would have coatings that were formulated to, you know. Minimize dust and then the angle that they would be at if they're perpendicular to the ground, then that there's less chance of the dust going off. But I think that's an engineering challenge um, and not something that would be from limitation or, or eliminated from the discussion. Yep. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing I thought about uh, when Maddie and Jack were talking about particle tracking and, and optical sensors was the ability to release particles of uh, a known size and density that were essentially transported there, right, with the instrument. It'd be great, uh, especially if those could be tracked long range, down the range. Um, similarly, the ability to scoop up particles or collect them right in the, the high profile book surface and then label them for the sensor. And we remember the highly reflective surface, something like that um, would be super popular as well. Just to go back to the, the dust issue, you can also bring in like dynamic baselining, which is what we're doing with the Santry. So even as the dust is coating, getting on the lens with when we use them at the salt and seed, which is a dusty place, we're constantly adjusting that until you probably run out of baseline to adjust to uh but th that and it also baselines for the light as well because as the sun travels across the sky it can enter into the the optical gate sensor you have to adjust for that as well another uh, that's a good point i guess it goes to the lifetime of the, of the optical system it, it's certainly coastal they follow very quick you know, salt uh, sort of position and it just coats the remains in the dark and I don't know if that's an issue on Mars. You know, just to think about um, you know, salts or CO2, the ice, the positive line. Another couple minutes, and then we'll go to break. Uh, interesting also, I think it would be interesting if it's great to have very high resolution imagery, but also as people that work in the field, like we just spending time in the field and seeing what's going on is a, is a big part of knowing what questions to ask and how to get at them. And so just having um, kind of constant like imagery would be, you know, this is of the, of the site conditions and something I don't think we should.
Mm -hmm. Which I think one thing that we haven't brought up yet, and maybe it's because it's not feasible, is you know, in the field we're usually using saltation traps. And so I'm wondering if there's any way to trap the sediment and then have that automatically weigh and release sediment so that we can get a profile of, of, of what's in it and maybe even taking that sediment that we capture at different heights to to actually you know maybe like find a density like get the bulk density then get the particle size et cetera in addition to the vertical concentration. Well there's lots of comments on gone um Saying they uh, they try and make it in pile of soil on inside, but they didn't really see much changes because it was perhaps not an interesting mm -hmm. area of the site. But the principle could could be blind. We're out our thoughts. Just to follow up on that, you know, there's a lot of designs for the field where that's been useful, and that's in my view, especially we're talking about purpose setting, that sort of thing. If you had it falling in the right area, then that camera and some of their size distributions. They're probably actually more reliable if they're dispersed onto some this you know, from particles from different heights. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, and to, I think to echo Christy's point, also, I think it's important to try as much as we can to, to use instruments um, that will give us data that we need. Like have method for analyzing well from on Earth, just to be able to know how to have something to compare them to. I think this is like a big compliment. Christy, you're having right now with the field PIV system. It's just like this is amazing data, but what do I do with it? Um, and not that it's not useful and important, but um, still like that would be important. So still having some anthropometers, thinking of still really trying to bring instruments that we are familiar with. And, Okay, uh, Jalex and Jalex, I see. I only want to make one comment about site distribution. Uh, if it is bugs or anything else, not only about the size of the particles, but we see we uh, as well can measure its shape, and I think shape is also very important, especially for real alien transport. So I think the size and shape we must remember about. You know, how we're doing to covering different aspects of this is good. You want to do you have any final comments since you got the mic? <laughs> Anything that you think we missed? <laughs> um, well, my main comment would be that optics, optics would be great, but I suspect that it's very data intense. Mm -hmm. Um, no, you don't think so. No, not, not with on board processing. Let, let's hold that for the next discussion. Through. Yeah, exactly. That's. Whereas something like a microphone, that's just a pain. That's one number, one integer, and that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they missed us. Sorry, how are we going to measure that? Yeah, we haven't covered dust mainly. Really we don't have time. I agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Maybe we need to add some comments in the chat on the yeah. dust. Oh, oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, so, one of the things with traps is efficiency. So, I don't know if the RD required uh, from, a, from a different time. Uh, Atmosphere perspective. But if you're looking to use that for size, shape, and things like that, you're already your uh, But yeah, I do realize that we've, we've not really addressed dust measurements uh, in any great detail. So maybe, maybe when we come back into the chat, like yeah. is, is anybody here in the room or online? Or, or when we about? come back. Everyone put on your thinking caps for the break and come back with a few ideas for dust. Yeah, there's just a comment here from Don about Alejandro's instrument and then um to assess local dust uh, concentration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose. Um, as opposed to columnar optical depth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, do we want to hear from Alejandro for just a minute? Or? Do you want to hear now or just after the break? Do we need a break right now? Let's let's do a okay. round now okay. for a minute to have some and round out the instant text. Sounds good. Go That's ahead. Good. Do you want to talk on online? Is that to me, Alejandro? This is Alejandro. 
Yes, if you yeah, don't yeah. mind giving us a brief rundown on dust instrumentation. Yeah, so um, to not be biased towards my, my own development, um, there are, of course, a number of ways to try to go after um, dust, and some of it, it depends on what your scientific goal is. You know, often that's how this stuff needs to be driven. But, you know, historically, a lot of the work has been done by just looking at um, the uh, changes in optical depth in the atmospheric column above you, right? So, uh, he's not the only one, but I know Scott Gazewicz and others have been using uh, MSL and uh, Perseverance um, cameras when they're pointing up into the sky, getting full sky data and pulling out optical depth information. And you make some assumptions and you try to derive a... Uh, um, uh, a particle concentration in the atmosphere, maybe even a particle distribution based on some assumptions. There are a little bit better instruments for doing that on um, perseverance as part of the meta package, although I'm not because I'm always swamped, not up to date on the recent publications on that, but that's all very optical and you're looking at the whole column. You're trying to derive information, not just at the surface going up. If you want to start understanding a little bit closer down to the surface uh, and to understand um, the uh, dust and you start blending into the range of, of uh, sand particles as well. But understand what's going on with dust near the surface so you can relate it to lifting and stuff like that. There are a number of instruments um, that have been proposed that are all basically, um, there's a bunch of them that are all similar design. Uh, so there's two categories of them. There's one where I know, and Donna has something like this, um, I don't know if his saltation sensor could uh, be stretched into dust, if you can make a sense of it enough, but there's a lot of things where you basically just let dust and salt impact on a surface, whether that's, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the mechanism, but there are mechanisms that can um, electrically respond to the impact and then you sort of derive what the size uh, of the particle is from, from the momentum. And then the other class that I've seen are all, and this is where my instrument is, are sort of laser-based, uh, basically laser Doppler velocimeters. Um, they're of the three primary groups I know of, but they're not the only ones out there, um, are uh, John Marison at, uh, in Denmark has an instrument. Uh, they does two axis wind measurements, but basically he's getting the wind by measuring the dust. And so in that process, he also can get a, an effective dust size and the dust concentration at the same time. And that's an instrument he's uh, tested in a wind tunnel and may have been on one of the ExoMars missions, um, but I'm not uh, up to date on that. Um, the other one is um, Esposito. I believe her name, first name is Francesca es Esposito in, in Italy. She definitely has an instrument on one of the ExoMars missions that was supposed to land, I think possibly um, uh, Rosalind Franklin. And so I think she's in limbo because of the Ukraine war has suspended that mission, but she has a la laser Doppler uh, velocimeter instrument that basically intakes dust particles into her little cavity and then measures the, the um, particle concentration and an effective size. And then the, uh, the final one is mine, which is another laser Doppler velocimeter, except I don't, I don't pull it into the, into a, um, a chamber to measure it. I try to leave it out in the flow. And, but again, I'm measuring, um, I'm actually attempting to measure three axis uh, size along with um, particle concentration. And with mine and with more and Marison's instrument, since we're not um, moving the dust into a sort of a chamber, we just let it flow by. We actually also get the, the wind speed that way as well. So it becomes a complement to the uh, sonic anemometer. Those are the major ways of measuring dust that I'm aware of. And, and I think this is an important thing because I don't think we have good characterization of what the dust size distribution can be uh, on Mars. We, we make a lot of uh, assumptions and estimates. And I would point out that on Earth, there's a lot of work by um, uh, the last thing, the group out, I think, in Southern California, Coke and others, um, where they're actually demonstrating that the, the shape of the dust particles have an impact on the radio transfer effects of dust in the atmosphere and heating in the atmosphere. And they're seeing that on Earth. If they're seeing that on Earth, it's got to be important stuff for Mars where dust is even more important. So I think that's a long enough rant for me. I'll stop there. Thanks, Alejandro. That's really great overview and, and clearly some complementarity there with the sonic anemometry ideas as well. 
Uh, Don just posted a few more uh, final comments. The, the saltation center will doesn't really get to dust at the moment, um, but they've also developed a simple two color pack scatter uh, and then go on much uh, that might yield local dust or opacity. So that might also be handy. Okay, I think we'll we'll leave it there for the instrumentation. And we now have a 15 minute, 20 minute break. Do a 10 minute break. 10 minute break. Ten minute break. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Online folks, I'm gonna mute. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes. So 1005 California.